Hello, my friends. Welcome to Trending. Today is Thursday, March 16th. It's about 9.50 as we're getting ready to record here. St. Patrick's Day Eve. Yes. St. Patty's right. Eve. I don't think that's a thing, but let's make it a thing. We, we just made it a thing. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Heard it here first. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We're going to take um, kind of a different uh, route on our conversation today. But Joe, you held on the fort by yourself last week. I was in Orlando last week at the Exponential Conference. My first time there, I didn't know this, but I think it's maybe the largest Christian conference. There's over 5,000 people there. It's and then, huge. And they have to like cap it, right? Um, but yes. sometimes when you make things scarce, uh, it just draws more people to it. It's true. It's a marketing technique. Yes. Brilliant. So you did a good job holding on the fort by yourself last week. Did a great job. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> Even though my sunburn picture maybe wasn't quite as accurate as you might want it to be. <laughs> you so, look better was, today. Yeah. I look so much, <laughs> so much more fresh. <laughs> that was great. So I thought today, Joe, we talked, there's, you know, of course, there's always a lot of things in the news. There's a lot of sports news right now. Yeah. You and I could geek out about sports easily for an episode, but we'll try not to bore you with that. So nice. um, I thought maybe I'll just throw out a couple of the things I heard at the conference that I thought were interesting and might have some impact on kind of church culture. I'm sure you'll have several things to chime in both historically and culturally. So let's just do that today. Let's do Does it, that for you? Let's do it. Yeah. So. Exponential. The big thing, this conference um, is kind of focused on evangelism and how the church can grow in that, especially in like today's culture. How can we do it in a, in a culture where it's maybe like a little taboo in some regards? How can we do it effectively? Uh, how can we effectively share our faith in today's culture? So I just jotted down um, kind of three points that stuck out to me. And so let me just toss those to you, Joe, and we'll see where we go. Oh, so it's good. John Mark Comer, he's a pastor who's one of my kind of favorite thought leaders right now. I like him a lot. He had, I thought was an interesting statement. He said that 80% of evangelism in the early church was done by ordinary Christians just explaining their life to their friends. And I like to tell you a word of that. I think the early church grew with ordinary people just talking to people, right? Which I, sometimes I think we kind of overly complicate this stuff, right? We And maybe a lot of the church growth didn't necessarily happen in a church building in large part because the church was being still being formed in those early years, right? Mm, right. What do you think about that quote, Joe? 80% of evangelism was done by ordinary Christians explaining their life to their friends. What, what, what does that make you think about? I mean, I think it certainly seems plausible. It's hard to probably say the exact percentage, but there's a, a great book out there by Ramsey McMullen, a uh, scholar, a book that everybody tends to quote these days. Okay. It's called The uh, Christianization of the Roman Empire, years 100 to 400. So this okay. is like the... The rapid growth of the church. Yeah. Because I mean, church starts small. We get that picture in the book of Acts, just 120 people, then a few thousand people, and then it begins to kind of grow from there. We get this general statement that every day, you know, people were being added to this group of people. Mm -hmm. But we do see some uh, shrinking of the church, either through just persecution, people afraid to being called Christian or people losing their lives because they're Christian. But by like 400 AD, mm -hmm. This, there's millions of people uh, who are Christian, and yeah. um, Constantine, the emperor, he sees this movement, and I think it seems like he wants to capitalize on the growth and the popularity of Christianity. I think he used it for his political advantage. Uh, but there's some debate about that, mm -hmm. uh, but he begins to draw these like conferences together. So yeah, I mean, these ecumenical councils, some of the big uh, watershed moments of the church where the faith gets codified, doesn't really happen until the 300s, 400s, up into six and seven centuries. And so really there's like no institution mm -hmm. driving the growth of the church. It really is quite relational. And one of the things that McMullen says in his book is a lot of the growth of the church where people become aware of Christ, they may not become Christian, but they become aware of Jesus is through this relational connection. Yeah. And he would share stories about how maybe the next door neighbor's mom's got some sort of illness. And so the Christian family next door hears about it mm -hmm. and they go pray for this person and that person gets better. And so obviously they're thinking, okay, your, your God has power. Your God has care and concern. Yeah. Tell me more about this God. So it's quite this natural mm -hmm. flow of conversation of natural influence on people. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't an intricate part of Roman life. It was just one of many religious options out there. Mm -hmm. And really like Christianity brought a different idea of what religion was to the Roman Empire. There's a longer, nerdier conversation about that. But what we think about religion today wasn't what they thought about religion uh, back in the early days of Christianity. Today, we can kind of add religion to other things about our life. This is my favorite sports team. This is the religion yeah. that I choose. This is where we go vacation, you know, type of a thing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a topic of our conversation, maybe yeah. a touchy topic of conversation. Religion is something that bound someone's whole life together. Mm -hmm. uh, the word religion 
like the middle operative word of that compound word is like where we get ligaments, where all of life is bound together by one source. And so uh, when a person chose Christianity, mm -hmm. they were kind of saying no to a lot of other things. They were yeah. probably going to lose political clout, uh, social uh, notoriety if they embrace if they were to embrace Christianity. And so it really was quite something for a person in the Roman world mm -hmm. to, to choose Christianity. It would be like anyone in our audience bailing on republicanism and embracing, like becoming a Democrat. Like you'd probably lose friends over it. Uh, people would um, instantly chide you about your change in decision. And so it was a significant thing. But what we have are some data that it did happen by the scores of people over time. And it wasn't because of an institution. It was because mm -hmm. of life on life and these small communities truly uh, influencing their their world around them. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot we could learn from that, right? Yeah, like, that's, yeah. A lot of, if we want, really want the church to grow, it's on us, right? Mm -hmm. Not on the building of this place. It's on us to do that, right? That's right. So on that topic, so let me throw two more things out here. We can maybe okay. talk about it a little bit. So yeah. um, Jay Pathak, I'm not really super familiar with him, but he, he I think his kind of main work is the, the idea of the art of neighboring. Yeah, he's got a big book that really by did. that title, yeah, yeah. which is a cool concept. So his kind of main thing was, in in like the story of the Good Samaritan, when the when they ask who is who is my neighbor, in modern Christianity, I think what he was saying at least is that we tend to over um, analyze that word. So we we say well, who is our neighbor. We tend to jump to like oh well our enemies are our neighbors and everyone's our neighbor and we kind of make it a really inclusive thing, which is good. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. But he's saying that in our world today, we actually need to actually focus on our actual neighbors, right? Like how well do you know the people that you actually see every day? And the person who lives, you know, 50 feet away from you, do you actually know their story? How can you pour it into their life? And sometimes we get so interested in everyone's our neighbor that we don't pay attention to the people that we actually do interact with all the time. So he said, don't let neighbors become only a metaphor, but actually engage in the people who are closest to you. So that was interesting. And on a similar note, uh, Christine Kane, a speaker that a lot of people probably are familiar with, she had some good thoughts about how, I mean, today, again, in today's culture, people are far less likely just to wander into a church. We get very few of those people at Rich Point these days who just wander in without any invitation or formal relationship, right? She says to make an impact in the world today, people are much more likely to join you at a meal at your table than they are to actually come into a church. So her whole thing was be radically hospitable mm -hmm. like in, your, in, in your community, in your interactions, be radically hospitable, bring people into your circle outside of your church life. And then you might be able to expand that into some kind of religious conversation. Yeah. So yeah, when you hear that, Joe, what do you think? I think it's good. I mean, I think I agree with you. I think the the way in which um, neighbor is broadened uh, to our global village, I think it's a, an important fixture. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we are super connected. I mean, one of the headlines uh, within the banking world today is how a bank struggling in Switzerland is actually causing a lot of anxiety over in America. We are connect yeah. more connected than we could ever imagine. We're never far away from somebody. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right. And I think this is something that the church struggles with because what, why would you ever invest in your literal neighbors around you? Well, mm -hmm. it's because you want to enlarge your friends group. You like to have community with people. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you go to a church community, like get in your car, drive to a church building, come to worship, come to the events, like game nights uh, mm -hmm. with your church friends, mm -hmm. skating parties yeah. with your church friends, all like all the parties that we throw, right? But we tend to not have now the, the margin mm -hmm. to spend time hanging out with our neighbors because, well, we, we almost like, talk ourselves out of getting to know those folks mm -hmm. because, wow, I don't need more friends. I've got a hundred friends at church, right? right. Or, or I've got a few friends at work, right? But these are the people that we could probably have the most genuine relations with, ships with because we can have a lot of conversations together. Mm -hmm. We can spend some time together. And so there is, we do sense that there is this movement back towards physical streets, physical neighborhoods in order mm -hmm. to befriend people. Um, and I, th I think we're seeing the change in architecture. It's kind of funny to study and this would be great to have a someone who's been in like the home business to, mm -hmm. to help us narrate this. Yeah. But um, for whatever reason, like we have uh, smaller dining rooms than ever. Uh, mm -hmm. There was an era of how homes that are smaller dining rooms because people were eating in front of their TVs. Yeah. And, right. So to even like have people over to your dining room is, is a bit hectic, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we see is uh, bigger backyards, hardly any front porches. Yeah. But if you look at homes back in the day, like they actually had bigger porches because you would assume that you're going to be hosting people yeah. on your front porches. And so like there's this huge industry now of building like these outdoor kitchens, 
elaborate backyard landscapes because people do have a craving to host people. Yeah. Um, and right now it's like homes aren't really suited for that. Yeah. And so now we have to begin to retrofit homes that were built in a certain era. And so I do think these are positive signs. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think we have to have a strategy uh, then to say, okay, I'm going to like spend time with these people. They're probably not going to share my interests, probably okay. even share some of the core things about who I am. Canada Develop, which I've been, I've been listening, reading to a great book called uh, Trying Softer by a Christian um, counselor. And she talked about this window of uh, tolerance hmm. uh, that we need to have if we want to be like emotionally healthy human beings. Hmm. Something about the pandemic and our political environment has shrunk our windows of tolerance. And so actually what's maybe a critical part of our discipleship going forward, if we're going to be better neighbors, is we need to implore one another to have a greater window of tolerance to be around so that we don't fly off the handle, give a hot take, hmm. unnecessarily offend people because they don't agree with us, even on some core things about us. Mm -hmm. Because going back to the early church, they were a minority. They were, uh, as uh, one uh, scholar with a very popular book said, they were resident aliens. They were strange people, yeah. not going anywhere, buying mortgages, building homes, uh, building the families in these environments where they were the minority and not the majority. And so there, there was an opportunity mm -hmm. there, but there's also a stress there. And how do we handle that stress? How do we navigate that? We have to, by the grace of God, see our window of tolerance grow for the sake mm -hmm. of befriending people. Because yeah. that's the very first step of this thing, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. for people uh, to care about us, to know that we care about them, and then it begins to open up. Because what evangelism kind of looks like, if at least in my mind, ever since the dawn of postmodernism, mm -hmm. is um, we have to win people's world before they're one to Christ. This is what I mean. Like I, What we see, I think, in, in a critical step in evangelism is that people want... They, the first step is they want the claims of the gospel to be true, even sometimes before they believe. They have to have a curiosity. Hmm. They have to have an interest because uh, trying to argue objectively, even on religious truth, we're just two steps away in a conversation of people saying, well, who says your truth is more accurate than my truth, right? Yeah. So how do we get through that? We get through that by people being so compelled by our life and by the way that we live and the values that we have. Like, they actually want to warm up to the idea first, maybe even try Christianity on yeah. before they ultimately embrace it. Mm -hmm. That's what seemed to be happening in the first 400 years of the church. It seems like we're having a similar moment in a time like ours in a post-Christian America like ours. Yeah. Well, that's really good. So our time, we could talk about this for hours, uh, but I guess yeah. just to, as we start to wrap up, I want to hear just kind of one clarification. So obviously our culture is like incredibly divided, right? Mm -hmm. It's just insane. Right. Some that's of the right. stuff going on in the world that's is right. just... It's sad how divisive and how angry mm -hmm. it seems like everybody is. Very sad. Yeah. And so one of the, again at the conference, one of their themes was lost cause. Like, is evangelism a lost cause? Mm. How do we actually share our faith in a culture that's so divisive? Right. So we talked about that a little bit. Like, I think the whole neighboring thing, just being a decent person, the people that we interact with all the time, is surprisingly a great place to start. Right. Right. But where do you have anything else to say about that? About the whole lost cause idea in our culture today? You've already mentioned this a little bit, but. Mm. How, because we're called to share our faith, right? Like it's, it's hard and it's, especially in our culture today, it's, it seems very countercultural to share our faith with people, yeah. but it's what we're called to do, right? Yeah. And so how, do you have anything else to say about how can we effectively do that in the culture that we're in right now? Oh my gosh. Okay. So, I mean, a lot, well, there's a lot we could say here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would prefer not to consider non-Christians lost people. I mean, how, how yeah. would you like that for an icebreaker? Like, hey, you're a lost person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And d does Jesus use that language? Maybe. I mean, I think um, he uses lost as in like the lost sheep of Israel. So people are already in, but maybe mm -hmm. not on the path. And so we could debate semantics of that word. But I, I guess I'll say this. Mm -hmm. I don't think people will ever cease to um, talk about what's most important to them. That's, mm -hmm. I, I think, a critical part of who we are. That's out of the box, human beings magnify things. Uh, yeah. We can call it worship. We can call it um, idolizing something. But we can't help but talk about the things that matter the most to us. Mm -hmm. If you like, just try this out. If you're ever in a conversation that's going nowhere, just talk about what you're watching on TV and everybody starts chiming in mm -hmm. on what they're like, streaming and watching. Like, yeah. it, it, and they can't help themselves. Like they, they don't have to force themselves. They don't need a sermon to convince them to like yeah. talk about what's the, what matters most to them. I think if we actually say evangelism is just trying to make much of Jesus. In the way that Jesus would want us to make much of him. That's a critical thing that Dallas Willard said. He was writing a book on evangelism uh, as he passed away. And so someone was able to finish it. 
um, after he passed away, but it's called The Allure of Gentleness. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful title, by the way. Mm-hmm. But he says, if you're going like, to do a uh, talk about Jesus in the way that he would talk about himself, and he, and I think the way that um, he talks about in First Peter, uh, the New Testament talks about First Peter, is yes, you need to be able to have a reason mm-hmm. for the hope that we have, give a reason for the hope that we have, but do it with gentleness yeah. and respect. Mm-hmm. Um, adults don't want to be clobbered, and they're probably not going to be persuaded by that. But gentleness and respect might actually be the most effective way to do that. And so I don't think that we need to talk the church into evangelizing. I think we need to capture our story again. Um, I think we need to talk about it in ways that Jesus would talk about it. And I, I don't know about you, but I I became a Christian a little bit later in life. I mean, I, I went to church, I was exposed to church's teaching, but I embraced Jesus for myself in, in high school years, um, formative years. But I could have said no to it. It wasn't like forced down my throat or whatever. But I think what's what, what, uh, what lured me into Christianity and what continues to make me interested in continuing to follow Jesus mm-hmm. is the story itself yeah. and the person in the middle of the story. It's mm-hmm. really nothing else. And I think that if we can share the story in a way that's provocative, in a way that's true, and that brings out the best of his brilliance, then people will always be eager to hear it. Now, they may not embrace it, but I think that they'll always be eager to hear it. Um, I think we see this with like the, the phenomena, phenomena of the chosen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, there's people yeah. who argue about like the effectiveness or the accuracy of the, of the chosen but I'm telling you, like it is having a great effect because there's a chance for people to see how the story about the people in and around Jesus is unfolding, mm-hmm. and it resonates with current issues and current personality things today. And people yeah. can see themselves in the story, right? And as they can do that, then they actually bump into mm-hmm. the risen Christ. Uh, because I love the way that Mark ends his gospel. The very the, the traditional ending of Mark's gospel ends in verse eight, where Jesus is raised, but he's not seen. The tomb is empty. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Mark does that on purpose. It's like a neat little pastoral nugget. Hmm. He's saying, then you might just bump into him anywhere you hmm. can imagine. Hmm. You might bump into him at the stands of the soccer field. You might bump into him at the Doritos aisle at Dylan's. Hmm. And I think that's the most provocative piece of this gospel. Yeah. Jesus is divine, but he's also the human one. He's been raised, but he hasn't been seen. Therefore, we're bumping into him yeah. in all areas and all places in life. Hmm. So what the church needs to do it's not to be the hero in telling the story, but guide people to figuring out where God's already showing up in their life. Yeah. You just nu- what's well, something that Lynn Sweet said in his book on evangelism is you nudge people awake. Mm-hmm. You don't scream at them to wake them up, but you nudge them awake to see the God who's always been there. God yeah. who's been weaving their story together. That's probably the most provocative way that we could talk about Jesus in a culture like ours, where people are making up their own mind. There's many options out there. Jesus is just one of many options in American life right now. So how do we stand out above the rest? Yeah, you just mentioned nudging, Joe, and I feel like, I mean, that's how people change anyway, right? Like, people don't make dramatic shifts overnight. It's nudges, right? Yeah. So I think if we can get better at nudging people, slowly bringing Jesus in our conversation, one of the great things about Jesus, right? Like, I think a lot of the things that people don't like about Christianity or the church aren't things that actually Jesus did or talked about, right? Right. right. It's really hard to argue with Jesus. Right. If you just read Jesus' words, most people are going to be on board with what he said. Right. So a lot of the stuff that's kind of iffy or dicey in culture is stuff that the church or Christianity claims, but not necessarily Jesus. So, right. Anyway, we're getting a little bit long. Joe, you and I can probably talk about this for ages. Yeah. So how, how about this? We're kind of wrapping up here. Let's, we'll take a little pause. We might continue this conversation next week, unless, who knows, if if major news breaks or something else fun happens mm-hmm. in culture, we might shift, but we might continue this conversation in future weeks because there's a lot more that we could cover. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. And we love to hear from you like it, man. As yeah. you're engaging with this, <laughs> reach out to us. Um, it might be more suitable to send an email. It's easy to find our emails on our webpage, but maybe a couple things comes up, we can address those things directly. So feel free to do that always, but particularly for this topic, yeah. if you'd like. I think yeah. the evangelism conversation is a big one that we should keep having. So we'll we'll put a pin in it and continue it another time. Yeah, man. But hey, thanks to all of you for watching. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Of course, love to see you on Sunday. It's If you come, you'll see the constructions. Every day there's new things happening. So yes. Do your best to find a good parking spot. We're sorry for the inconvenience. It's kind of a mess around here, but we're rolling with the punches and good things are happening. So, okay. Have a great weekend. We'll hope to see you on Sunday. See you next time. See ya.